Welcome back everyone. This week we're going to look at radical Protestantism. So we're going to look at some of the ways in which the new Protestant movements that emerge across Europe in the aftermath of Martin Luther's Reformation uh, take a still more radical approach to uh, past uh, Christian traditional teachings uh, and uh, take a more uh, make a more radical break uh, with this past, a more radical uh, Reformation. And uh, the center of this movement is going to be in Switzerland. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about Switzerland. Basically, what we saw with uh, Luther uh, was an effort to maintain uh, a lot of the traditional appearances of the Catholic Church, at least in terms of its liturgy, for example, uh, but to uh, present that same outward appearance along with uh, a different teaching or as conveying uh, a different teaching, especially about the sacraments. But these uh, more radical Protestants are going to take Luther's more individualistic approach to Christianity, which is the basic premise that every individual should be able to go away and read scripture by themselves and come to their own conclusions about how to live out the Christian faith. And they're going to apply that um, basically to its logical extreme. Uh, and so they're going to reject anything that smacks of a hierarchy, either religious or political. And so this is going to lead to religious uh, turmoil, but also to political uh, instability in the center of Europe at this time. Uh, and so what we're going to explore is how these radical Protestants are able to bring about these, this change, uh, how uh, the extent to which you see religious and political agendas aligning and intertwining, and we'll look more generally at how this impacts society. Um, I just refer you to this image of Ulrich Zwingli, who we have on the leading slide here. And I think it's a great image because it shows him carrying a Bible, but also a sword. I think this is a great encapsulation of what radical Protestantism meant uh, to Europe. In general, the Protestant Reformation causes a huge upheaval in European society because you can't just change the way that people had practiced their religion when religion was a central part of the society. You can't just change that overnight and expect there not to be serious ripple effects. But with Zwingli, it's very overt that there's a political dimension to this, uh, to what at least begins or what is presented as a religious dimension, a religious change, a religious reformation. So we begin by talking about Zwingli and Zwingli's background. Uh, he was born in 1484, a year after Martin Luther, uh, in Switzerland to a wealthy farming family. Uh, he received a Renaissance education, a type of education we've uh, spoken about in some detail in this class. And he attended the same uh, university as uh, Conrad Celtis. So when we talked about the Northern Renaissance, we talked about Germany in the Northern Renaissance. We talked about Celtis and Celtis' interest in promoting the study of um, in promoting the study of languages and the study of literature. Uh, Zwingli, do, although he attended the same program, doesn't seem to have had the same interest. He seems to have been more interested in uh, philosophy. But he returns to his hometown and becomes a parish priest in 1506. And so uh, this, is, um, this is right around the time that Luther is having his conversion experience. So up until now, you could say that Zwingli's led a pretty traditional life. He comes from a wealthy family, isn't going to inherit, uh, but receives an education because of this wealthy background, uh, comes back and is, uh, receives a position of leadership in the community. Now, Zwingli had not received a great deal of theological training, but he is captivated, we understand, by the achievements of Erasmus. He's very interested in Erasmus's discoveries and achievements in the area of uh, languages and the study of the Bible as a literary text. And so he begins to study the Bible uh, by himself. So this is the background to Zwingli. Uh, like Luther, he becomes a priest without a whole lot of theological training. Like Luther, he is a very much a product of the world of education of the Renaissance. Now we have to talk about Switzerland. Uh, 
uh, Switzerland, uh, if we go way back to the foundations of medieval Europe, was part of the Middle Carolingian Kingdom. After Charlemagne's son died, there was war between the three surviving sons, and they divided Europe into three parts at the Treaty of Badat, a very significant treaty that laid out the framework for the rest of political European history. The Western Kingdom became the Kingdom of France, uh, the Eastern Kingdom would become the Holy Roman Empire and eventually Germany. And the Middle Kingdom uh, splintered very quickly into different parts and the two, the West Kingdom and the Eastern Kingdom, would fight over who would influence uh, what was left of the Central Kingdom. And so Switzerland throughout its history is always kind of in the middle of these two powerful forces. Uh, it becomes a province within the German Empire but a somewhat independent province. It often aligns its uh, political position uh, with France. At the same time, as we move into the 15th century, the German Empire is becoming weaker. The French kingdom is in the middle of the Hundred Years' War. And uh, so increasingly, there becomes a movement towards Swiss independence. And the geography of Switzerland encourages uh, this independence. Uh, it encourages uh, this independence because Switzerland is a land that's surrounded by mountains, it's very easy to defend, it's somewhat isolated from the regions of Europe around it. And so uh, this move towards independence is something that Zwingli supports. And so here's where you see Zwingli's theological uh, predispositions towards uh, reading the Bible alone, aligning with his political uh, inclinations to promote Swiss independence. Zwingli becomes renowned as a preacher, but he also becomes renowned for his immorality. Uh, indeed, he seems to have struggled to maintain clerical celibacy uh, and to have had numerous affairs uh, early on in his career. Uh, in 1518, he comes to the city of Zurich. So this is a sign of that Zwingli is rising to prominence. He's no longer uh, simply a parish priest in his local town. He's moved to one of the major cities uh, in Switzerland. And he begins to preach sermons uh, and to read Bible readings that do not follow the biblical readings that were prescribed by the church. So there was a, a church calendar that still is, uh, a Catholic church calendar that says this is what you're supposed to read from the Bible at Mass on this Sunday, basically on most days of the year. And Zwingli throws this out. Zwingli at this point says, and this is one year after Martin Luther has nailed his 95 theses uh, to the door of Wittenberg Cathedral, Zwingli says, this doesn't make sense. Uh, we're kind of bouncing around the Bible. Uh, I think it makes much more sense just to read the Bible from beginning to end. And so he begins to do this and to preach uh, sermons on his own cycle of biblical texts. And he, as well as rejecting church authority in terms of prescribing biblical readings, he begins to preach new ideas and to condemn traditional Catholic practices. He condemns monasteries, he condemns monasteries as institutions of obedience to authority, um, to human authority. He condemns the veneration of the saints and indulgences as a type of idolatry. And he asserts that the sacraments are only symbolic. So this is very important. This is where Zwingli breaks from Luther and where we have a new strand of the Protestant Reformation emerging. Whereas Luther had said uh, the, the sacraments are a sign and a promise of uh, Christ's grace and Christ's salvation, although Luther rejected some of the traditional Catholic sacraments, Zwingli argues that the sacraments are purely symbolic. The sacraments are only a sign. And this leads to uh, ferocious debates with Luther. Luther hated the fact that Zwingli was asserting that the Eucharist was in no way uh, the body and blood of Jesus. So for Catholics, Catholics are, are gonna argue that the Eucharist at the time of the consecration of the bread and wine during the mass, uh, this, although they still look like bread and wine, they are now the body and blood of Jesus. Luther is going to argue that at the time of consecration, they remain bread and wine. What's being offered to God remains bread and wine, but instead has Jesus's divinity added into it in some way. And then for Zwingli, Zwingli is going to argue that nothing changes. 
that these remain bread and wine. Um, there's no part of Christ's divinity in this, uh, but they are um, they symbolize uh, the unity of Christians. They symbolize uh, the teachings of Christ and, and the sacrifice of Christ. In 1522, uh, Zwingli breaks into open rebellion with the church, and he does this by hosting a party on Ash Wednesday, so this is the beginning of the Catholic season of Lent, at which he serves, uh, a, he basically has a cookout and serves sausages. Why is this a big deal? It's a big deal because uh, this was one of the days of the year when the Catholic Church required Catholics not to eat meat and to... Uh, only have one or two very simple meals. This was supposed to be the beginning of a season of, of penance. And Zwingli says, this is nowhere in the Bible. There's no season of Lent in the Bible. There's no prescriptions on eating meat. There's no such thing as Ash Wednesday. This is, these are all traditions that have been made up by human beings, and therefore they need to be rejected. And the bishop rebukes Swingley, and he tells him to adhere to the teachings of the church. Um, and so you have this debate between Zwingli and the bishop. And in 1523, uh, there's a debate between Zwingli and a representative of the bishop. And Zwingli wins the debate. Zwingli was a great uh, debater, and he convinces the city council to eliminate the practice of Christi Catholic Christianity in the city. And so all the clergy are required to follow Zwingli's teachings, and those who don't are banished. And now uh, this society is going to move forward into some fairly radical changes for the time. And so here you see this really interesting intersection of, um, of politics and religion. This is a religious debate. But now you have political power, the political power of the city council, that is... Um, that is participating in this debate, that is, uh, Zwingli is not only winning the debate, but the, he's using political power to enforce uh, his victories. And so the changes in these Catholic practices are going to dramatically change the way the society lived. Previously, days like Ash Wednesday, the calendar of the church, this has been how people mark the seasons in this society. So once this goes away, uh, there's a huge vacuum in the way that uh, people are going to be living their lives. So uh, this implement, the implementation of this city council order goes into effect. Monasteries are abolished, replaced by hospitals and schools. Uh, religious art and music are condemned. Uh, Zwingli teaches that these uh, religious paintings, um, some most religious music, that this is too sensory. This is a distraction. Uh, from from God, that we should rely only on the scriptures, on the word of God, in order to in order to follow God and in order to understand God. Uh, so this is an extension of nominalism, this philosophy that uh, I've been talking about uh, throughout this class. Uh, it uh, stems from a rejection of the idea that the world that we experience through our senses, that this can lead us to God. Uh, for uh, for a lot of the Protestant reformers, Zwingli and Luther and Calvin, uh, this is pretty blasphemous. Um, and this uh, is suggesting that there are ways to know God other than through uh, the scriptures and through the word of God. And that's very dangerous and that needs to be condemned. In 1525, the Catholic Mass is replaced by Bible services that follow Zwingli's cycle of Bible readings that he had pioneered before. Now, Zwingli is going to try and expand his reformation across Switzerland using political power. Switzerland at the time is divided into cantons, and five of the 13 cantons wish to remain Catholic. Um, that's not good enough for Zwingli, so Zwingli is going to blockade these uh, cantons in an effort to starve them into, um, into agreeing to become Protestant. And so this leads to a war in which the Catholic cantons launch a surprise attack and Zwingli is killed. So this defeat puts an end to military expansion in Switzerland, but it doesn't put an end to Zwingli's legacy. 